I'm going to start by asking you a very profound and important question. How do you feel about blue cheese? Many of us have very strong opinions one way or the other. I'd like you to think of someone who does not share your opinion on blue cheese and consider whether you'd be happy to have this person as a neighbor, as a close friend, or as a romantic partner. And keep these feelings in mind. Here's another controversial issue. Abortion. Should it be legal or illegal? Think about your own opinion, and now tell me if you'd be happy to have someone who does not share your opinion on abortion as a neighbor, a close friend, or a romantic partner. The questions I've just asked you are adapted from research by Linda Skitka at the University of Illinois. And her research has shown that there's something special about moral attitudes, like opposition to abortion, relative to non-moral attitudes, like your feelings on blue cheese. And as you might expect, disagreeing on moral issues is much more damaging to social relationships than disagreeing on non-moral issues. And why is it that a blue cheese lover is perfectly happy to befriend, marry, have kids with a blue cheese hater, but there exist anti-abortion extremists who think it's justifiable to kill another human being just because he disagrees with them? We have to figure this out because we now live in a world where extremists, powered by their moral convictions, can do a lot of damage. We can start by asking how it is we know what is right and what is wrong. And actually, this question doesn't even make sense to a lot of us because people often experience moral beliefs as if they are objective facts about the world. We have some evidence for this from research by Jeffrey Goodwin and colleagues. He's now at the University of Pennsylvania. He presented subjects with a series of statements in the following categories. Facts, like Boston is further north than Los Angeles. Ethics, like opening gunfire on a crowded city street is wrong. Norms, like wearing pajamas to a TED talk is wrong. And tastes, like classical music is better than rock music. For each of these statements, subjects had to answer yes or no to the following question. Does the statement have an objectively correct answer? And here's what they found. Not surprisingly, people felt most strongly that facts had a correct answer, while tastes did not. But notice that the statements of ethics looked more like facts than like tastes. And we see this overlap between facts and values in the brain as well. Sam Harris and colleagues scanned people's brains while they evaluated the truthfulness of factual statements, ethical statements, and religious statements. They found that a brain region called the medial prefrontal cortex, shown here, was more active when people believed a statement to be true rather than false. But importantly, this region did not differentiate between the different categories of beliefs. So mathematical beliefs, like 2 plus 2 equals 4, showed a similar pattern of activity to ethical beliefs, like it's wrong to take pleasure at another's suffering. The upshot of all of this is that we think that there's a right answer to moral questions. And here's the rub. If you and I disagree, and we both can't be right, well, clearly it's me who's right. My facts trump your facts. And therefore, you must be stupid or unreasonable. And of course, this kind of language is all too common in politics these days. But there's an important and dangerous difference between disagreeing on facts and disagreeing on moral values. Because you see, if you think that one plus one equals three, I might think you're stupid or a little strange. But if you and I disagree on a moral issue, not only do I think you're stupid and unreasonable, but also a bad person, maybe even less than human. Moral values are like facts on steroids. They have really strong emotions attached to them. And unfortunately, these emotions often come with a motivation to harm or eliminate the other side. And this is a big problem. Because while we readily accept that tastes and opinions can change, facts are facts. You have your facts, 
and I have my facts. And we're both so committed to those realities that it's senseless to expect that either of us will ever change. Imagine trying to convince someone who's red, green, colorblind that these two circles are different colors. There is nothing you can say to convince this person to see the world the way you see it. And the same, unfortunately, appears to be true with differences in moral viewpoints. Values seem like facts, and facts are fixed properties of reality. So where do we go from here? I wanted to understand how and why it is we hold on so tightly to our moral convictions, myself included. And I'm a neuroscientist, so naturally I started poking around in people's brains. And I found out that our moral values are a lot less stable than they appear to be. What if I told you that a pill could change your judgment of what's right and what's wrong? Or what if I told you that your sense of fairness could depend in part on what you had for breakfast this morning? You're probably thinking that this sounds like science fiction, right? Neurons in the brain use chemicals called neurotransmitters to talk to each other. Here we have two neurons. The gap between them is called a synapse. To transmit a message across the synapse, one neuron must release neurotransmitters into the synapse where they bind to receptors on the other side and propagate the message. Our brains produce and release these chemicals in response to various situations. My colleagues and I wanted to know whether manipulating people's neurotransmitters could change the way people respond to moral situations. In one study, we presented our subjects with a series of moral dilemmas, like the following. There's a trolley, and it's headed out of control towards five workers on the tracks who will die if you do nothing. However, you can stop the trolley by pushing a man who's carrying a heavy briefcase onto the tracks, and he will die, but the five others will be saved. The question is, is it morally acceptable to harm this one person in order to save the others? Now, of course, there's no objectively correct answer to this question, uh, but there are two schools of moral thought that take opposing views. The utilitarian school, rooted in the works of philosopher David Hume, judges the merits of actions based on the outcomes they produce. So morally appropriate actions are those that result in the greatest good for the greatest number. In contrast, the deontological school, grounded in the works of philosopher Immanuel Kant, judges the actions themselves. So there are right actions and wrong actions, and outcomes are irrelevant. In the example I just described to you, utilitarians would say it's appropriate to push the man onto the tracks because more lives are saved in the end. Whereas deontologists would say it was, it's inappropriate because harming is just fundamentally wrong. My colleagues and I asked 30 people to judge right or wrong in moral dilemmas like the one I described, and we wanted to know whether tinkering with a specific brain chemical called serotonin would change people's judgments of right and wrong. We used a drug called a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, or SSRI, similar to the antidepressant Prozac, and these drugs basically work by enhancing the actions of serotonin in the brain. On one session, our volunteers answered and made judgments and moral dilemmas um, while on the influence of the SSRI. And on another session, they made moral judgments while on a placebo pill. Here's what we found. On placebo, our volunteers said it was appropriate to harm one to save many others in about 40% of the cases that we presented to them. And when we gave them the SSRI, they were significantly less likely to say it was acceptable to harm one to save many. Now, take a second to think about these results. The debate between utilitarians and deontologists has been raging for hundreds of years. And we gave people a pill, and without their even knowing it, they gave different answers to this question of whether it's okay to harm one to save many others. Could the difference between Hume and Kant all boil down to a couple of chemicals in their brains? And on a more serious note, what are the implications of this for other ethical questions? So taking this idea further, my colleagues and I wanted to know whether changing serotonin levels could influence the way people respond to being treated unfairly. We used a game from economics called the ultimatum game. 
There are two players, a proposer and a responder. The proposer suggests a way to split a sum of money with the responder, and the responder can either accept, in which case both players are paid accordingly, or he can reject, in which case neither player gets any money. Many studies have now shown that responders will typically reject offers that they perceive to be unfair, which makes sense. I think a lot of us are willing to give up some money in order to punish someone else who's treated us unfairly. The question was, can we shift around people's responses to unfairness by changing their serotonin levels? And we did this by manipulating people's diet. So we get the raw ingredient for serotonin. It's called tryptophan, and it's an amino acid. And we must constantly replenish our supply of tryptophan by eating protein-rich foods. In the lab, we can lower people's serotonin levels in their brains by giving them a protein shake that lacks tryptophan. And on the placebo control treatment, we give them a protein shake that looks and tastes the same. The only difference is that it does contain two and a half grams of tryptophan. So we gave these drinks to our volunteers and had them play the ultimatum game while in the role of responder. We measured rejection rates for unfair, medium, and fair offers. And here's the placebo data. As you can see, people reject a lot of the unfair offers, and they hardly ever reject the fair 50-50 splits. Um, but when we lower their serotonin levels, rejection rates go up for the unfair offers. So again, just take a second and consider these results. The only difference between placebo and the depletion conditions is two and a half grams of tryptophan in the diet. That's it. Our volunteers didn't feel any difference between the two treatments, and they didn't notice any changes in their behavior. And yet, this subtle difference in the diet was enough to change the amount of money people were willing to give up to punish someone who treated them unfairly. Now, in these experiments, we artificially manipulated people's serotonin levels. But out in the real world, serotonin levels fluctuate naturally in response to changes in things like diet and stress levels. What this means is that our moral values are probably shifting a little bit all the time without us even knowing it. And we do have some evidence that this kind of thing is happening out in the real world. Shai Danziger and colleagues looked at judges' decisions of whether or not to grant parole to prisoners. Here on the vertical axis, we have the proportion of cases where they did grant parole. And on the bottom, we have basically time of day, the order in which cases were heard. These vertical dotted lines here, those are the judges' meal breaks. It turns out, if you're coming up for parole, all things considered, you are more likely to be granted parole if your hearing takes place after the judge had a snack. This is a huge effect, and it survives even if you control for other important factors, like whether or not it's a repeat offense or whether or not uh, the prisoner is enrolled in a rehab program. Now, I hope that this worries you at least a little bit. And uh, more seriously, I hope that I've convinced you that our moral values are a lot less stable than they appear to be. And this is important because it turns out that simply believing that moral values are changeable as opposed to fixed can have dramatic effects on our willingness to compromise and cooperate with each other. The Israel-Palestine conflict is one of the biggest ideological clashes of our time. It's resulted in thousands of deaths on both sides, huge costs in quality of life. Aaron Halperin, Carol Dweck, and colleagues recently reported that beliefs about whether groups have a changeable versus a fixed nature can influence Israeli and Palestinian attitudes towards each other and their willingness to compromise for peace. In their experiment, they randomly assigned Israelis and Palestinians to read one of two articles. One article suggested that aggressive groups have a fixed nature, and the other article suggested that aggressive groups have a changeable nature. Those who read the article about changeable groups were more willing to meet with the other side and hear their point of view, and more willing to negotiate and compromise on issues like the status of Jerusalem and settlements in the West Bank. What this means is, if we can wrap our heads around the idea that moral values are not fixed but can change, we're more likely to listen to each other. And here's a kind of crazy idea. If pills can shift our moral values, what if negotiators 
popped a few moral enhancers before going to the table. Such an intervention might make it easier for opponents to see each other's side. Now, of course, we have a long way to go before we fully understand which neurotransmitters shape which kinds of ethical beliefs. But I do think it's plausible that one day we will have the expertise to identify brain systems driving preferences for conflicting ethical principles. As long as we believe that moral values are unshakable, we will continue to invest our resources into fighting with each other, rather than searching for a middle way. Instead, can't we cultivate a healthy skepticism of our own sense of right and wrong? Because, you know, once we accept, once we accept that our values can be shifted by factors beyond our awareness and control, maybe we'll become a little less attached to them. And the sooner we can let go of this attachment, the better, because we've got some scary problems threatening our collective survival. But we're not fixing them because we're so caught up in bickering amongst ourselves. We're so caught up in bickering amongst ourselves. So, you know, I just hope that we can realize that we're caught in this ocean of hate and fear, and it's blinding us to our common humanity and the amazing things that we can achieve if we can put our differences aside and our heads and hearts together. It's time to wake up. Thank you.